Well, welcome and thank you so much for coming to the program tonight. And the topic today is eco-friendly homes, inside and out. So we'll talk about, and we have experts here to help you think through how to uh, reduce the amount of toxins that are in your household that you use either for inside or outside uh, lawn care. I wanted to start with some very basic overview information. Most of us, perhaps surprisingly, spend the majority of our time inside. How much time, what percent of the time do you think, on average, the average person spends inside? Anybody have a guess? That's it, 90%. Yeah, that's what EPA says anyway. I'm sure that's not true for everyone, but that's a lot of time inside. And so, um, also, EPA estimates that indoor air pollution can be twice as much as high as outdoor air pollution, up to five times as much. And considering that we spend so much of our time inside, it's really important to try and eliminate the sources of indoor air pollution. So why are, why is indoor air quality so much, why can it be so much worse? Well, there's several sources of air pollution in our, in our homes, and they include biologicals, which are things like mold and pet dander. Um, there, there are various compounds, such as radon or asbestos, which are not good for our health. Um, there, there are many products of combustion that can contaminate indoor air quality, including secondhand cigarette smoke, and combustion even from furnaces or even stoves, which gives off carbon monoxide. And if, if the appliance is faulty or if it's not properly vented, that can be a serious problem, as you know. And then there's a large category of substances called VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. And those are very widespread throughout the house. And so I want to talk just a little bit about those because those can be one of the major sources of poor indoor air quality. So sources are one reason, but poor home ventilation is another reason that indoor air quality can be bad. And so the, basically the three steps that one would take to try and improve indoor air quality are first, reduce the sources, and that's really what most of our presentation is about tonight. And then secondly, uh, improve the ventilation in your home. And then third, the third step, if you're still having a problem, would be to consider looking at various filtration systems. So indoor sources of VOCs, as I said, are very widespread. It includes all kinds of paints and solvents. It includes uh, wood preservatives, aerosol sprays and cleaning agents, um, air freshener, also any sort of stored fuel or automotive product, uh, hobby supplies, and even dry cleaned clothes can give off these compounds that volatilize readily in the air. And there definitely are health impacts of VOCs, and they include um, irritation of the eyes, nose, and throat. They can cause nausea or uh, loss of coordination, and then at, at higher levels, it can contribute to liver and kidney damage and even damage of the central nervous system. So it's really important to try and minimize those in your home. And then one of the most common sources of VOCs in a home can be from paint, especially when one has just painted. And so I wanted to spend just a minute on low VOC paints. If you're not familiar with those, those are now pretty readily available. I actually called all the locations in Fort Collins that sell paint, and every one of them except one did carry either low or no VOC paint. And uh, they're typically, though, for indoor paints. Not, you won't find low VOC paint so much for out ex exterior paint. Low VOC or no VOC per EPA's definition is any paint that has five or less grams per liter of uh, VOCs. And low VOCs, there are a lot of definitions of that, but that falls anything that's 200 grams per liter or less of VOC. So you can keep that in, in mind. And really, it's best to ask the uh, paint retailer for information about the paints. They often have material safety data sheets that can provide information. And there are various paint certifications if you're interested in looking on the web. Green Seal has a paint certification. Uh, there's another uh, organization called Green Guard that certifies paints. And then Green Sure is Sherman Williams' own brand of uh, paint certification. And then this topic of uh, indoor air quality is so broad, we couldn't possibly touch on everything today. But as, as I mentioned, it has a lot to do with cleaning products. And so one good uh, consolidated source where you can find information about green cleaning options 
Um, and also green building materials is the redirect guide and there's several copies of the guide in the back so just keep that as a resource. There are category listings in there and you can look up those are just some example categories that are relevant to this topic. So uh, that's all I wanted to say but I wanted to then review for you the speakers tonight and, and move on with the program. We're going to start off with Matt Zocali and he is uh, with the City of Fort Collins Utilities um, he's a, an environmental regulatory specialist, and um, he'll be talking about asbestos and mold. And then Aaron Hangler also is an environmental regulatory specialist with the city of Fort Collins. And she'll, she's worked for a long time with the city and prior to that with Larimer County on the issue of household hazardous waste. And she'll be talking about what to do with household hazardous waste and green cleaning options. And then Brian Woodruff is my colleague in the Natural Resources Department and he'll be talking about radon. Dr. Tony Kosky, who is a CSU professor and he's also uh, at the agricultural, works for the Agricultural Extension Service. He'll be speaking about green lawn care options. And then we'll wrap up with David Kemp, otherwise known as DK. He's the city's bike coordinator and he'll talk a little bit about bicycling because it's important to keep in mind that uh, auto, auto maintenance and repair has a lot of toxic materials associated with it. So bicycling um, does not and that's one reason that we've kept that as part of this program. My name is Matt Zocali, as uh, Lucinda said, and I work for the City of Fort Collins Utilities. Uh, the, uh, government, the Regulatory and Government Affairs Division, the group that I work with and that Aaron works with, our charge is to make sure that city operations fall uh, under their compliance uh, with environmental regulations. So that's what we do. Um, each of these issues that I'll be working on tonight, uh, the talking about tonight, probably deserve a lot longer of a presentation. However, we don't have that time. so. Uh, we'll just breeze through them as best we can, try and provide some good information without being too alarmist about any of these. Sometimes asbestos and things like that have a lot of fear associated with it. And hope we give, I hope uh, to give you a little bit of information to help out with that. So we'll start with asbestos. So what is asbestos? That's where we should probably start. Uh, it's a naturally occurring mineral fiber. Uh, it's very unique in that it breaks down into these small fibrils that become airborne. Now these far, small fibrils uh, give it some of the unique properties that, that makes asbestos a good material such as high tensile strength, um, good uh, or poor heat conductivity, and um, fire retardant, which is why it became uh, used quite a bit. It was added to over 3,000 products domestically, and uh, it's cheap. It's easy to get at, and there's a lot of it. So it, it became widely used. You can see a, a microscopic uh, view of, of some of those fibers, and, and you can imagine why those might cause a little bit of, uh, of trouble in your body. So one of the things I encounter a lot in my work with the city is this comment, is, oh, we don't have to worry about asbestos because it was banned. Well, that's a misperception. Some things were banned, some uses of asbestos were banned, but that had more to do with the way asbestos was applied. For instance, if you uh, used to be able to kind of come out to a work site, mix it up in a wheelbarrow and spray it up into the structural members of a building, that was banned by the Clean Air Act in 1973. Spray applied, structural fireproofing, those kind of things. And, and some, of, some of those uses were banned, however, the caveat was that the EPA allowed contractors to use up completely any remaining stores. So while there's not empirical data that tracks this, a lot of people in the industry say that uh, asbestos containing materials were put into products and still put into homes well into the 80s. Now a lot of folks say, okay, well it was banned. There was this rule that was passed. Well in 89, the EPA did come out with what's known as the ban and phase out rule. It would have effectively banned about 95% of use of domestic, uh, of, of asbestos use in domestic, domestic products here. However, there was a lot of pushback from the industry, industry folks in the regulated community, and in October of 1991, uh, it was repealed. The Fifth Circuit Court uh, vacated that ban and phase out rule. A month later, EPA appealed. That appeal was rejected. So there's no official ban on asbestos. Now, those uses that you see up there, they were subject. The court did uphold the, those bans. 
If anyone can tell me what any of those are or is involved with those, please let me know. I know rollboard was used a little bit around old uh, fireplace fixtures, but um, it doesn't apply to a whole lot, and it still is, uh, it still is used, it, coupled with uh, NAFTA. So the United States does have strict uh, regulations with asbestos-containing material. Asbestos still is put into products locally, in, in domestic products. It has to be very clearly labeled. Uh, material data sa uh, safety sheets, MSDS sheets, will show this information on it. But with NAFTA, you had products coming in from countries with less stringent environmental regulations, such as Mexico and Canada, and those products are commercially available. The other factor that came into play was Hurricane Katrina. There was a need right now for building materials in that area. And sometimes they didn't go through the same sort of oversight. And there's stories I've heard locally of people finding asbestos containing uh, putties and things like that in homes as new as uh, built in 2000 and 2001. So again, this is not to be alarmist, but it is to just emphasize asbestos is still an issue. There you go, you didn't think it was. Um, so despite regulatory oversight starting in the 70s, asbestos diseases are still rising, and I'm sure you've seen the commercials on TV about mesothelioma and things like that, and that has to do with the latency period, which is the period from the time of exposure until the onset of symptoms. Some of these can be as long as 40 years. So that's why we have a concern and continue to, to try and regulate this, um, this substance. So asbestos is still present in public, commercial, and oftentimes uh, private homes. And it is a known carcinogen. So you have to still be aware of this. Uh, some of the health effects, without going too deep into this, we, there were occupational studies done in shipyards and factories. This isn't done just on people, what they were exposed to in their homes, so keep that in mind. But we know that exposure to asbestos fibers can cause and increase the risk of lung cancer, mesothelioma, and, and asbestosis, which is a scarring of the lung. Uh, most of us are exposed to asbestos in our everyday lives. It's ubiquitous in the environment. It's in two-thirds of the rocks in the Earth's crust. It's all around us but we can fight that off. We have some defenses, and most of us do not develop these problems. So as a regulatory overview, we won't get into this too deeply, but uh, when we find asbestos, when it's found in a building, it is very highly regulated from the state to the EPA, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Department of Transportation, the local landfills where it is allowed to be disposed of, uh, the commerce, uh, this is a very highly regulated material once it's found. So where do you find it in your home? Here's some common places that you find it. Uh, roof and siding shingles, often it's thin, a little bit less than an eighth of an inch, kind of looks like cement, and it can contain asbestos material. A lot of asbestos in, uh, insulation and pipe wraps contain, uh, contain asbestos. Um, Libby, Montana, maybe some of you heard of the environmental uh, situation in Libby, Montana. The, the mine in Libby, Montana from W.R. Grace produced up to 90% of the world's supply of vermiculite. That vermiculite was contaminated with asbestos, tremolite asbestos, and it, it was blown into a lot of houses. So if you have an old house with old vermiculite insulation, um, it's a good idea to maybe have some of that material tested. Stove top pads, old gloves for heating. We, a lot of those things have been discarded, but you can find it uh, on pipe insulation, boiler gaskets, things like that. Um, the most common place we find it in our public buildings with the city is uh, floor tiles, vinyl floor tiles, and the, the adhesive used underneath. Pardon me. So if you're ripping up an old floor, be aware of what that material is underneath. Uh, okay, so here's a, a little graphic. Y you want to think systems in your house, plumbing system, mechanical system, the structural system, things like that. We, instead of getting down into the little nitty gritty, think large systems, where it might be. Uh, so what should be done if it's in the house? The first thing is don't panic. Manage this stuff in place. That's really the take home message. Unless, it's, unless you find some asbestos containing material that's extremely damaged, or is in an area of high traffic that might have the potential to be disturbed, 
You want to try and just watch it and close it if you can, you know, put some kind of barrier so you don't get in there. Because when you disturb it, when you get into it and try and remove it, there's a potential for those fibers to be released. If you can manage it in place, it still is good material. It's often left in our city buildings. If it's in the floor, we're not going to rip up the floor for just to take it out of there if it's stable. So you want to try and, and manage it in place. Um, you want to try and inspect it regularly. If you know that it's there, uh, maybe every year or every six months, make sure there's not a water leak that came down through that's damaged the material. And if you are going to remove it, definitely hire a professional. But if you do want to remove it from your home, um, it is within the Colorado Department of Health and Environment, uh, CDPHE, has a regulation, regulation number eight in the Air Quality Control Division. And that has to do with the management of asbestos containing materials. And there are limits for the private homeowner. If you're going to do a renovation project which disturbs asbestos above those levels you see there, you will have to notify the, the state of your project and you will have to get a permit. Now, there is an opt-out option. If you choose to say, my home is not an area of public access, you can waive that option, but you still have to show that you've disposed of that material properly. So you can do it yourself if you choose to. You don't have to go through the whole permitting process, but you do have to notify and you do have to be able to provide evidence that it went to the appropriate landfill. Here's some asbestos dues. As I said earlier, uh, keep activities to a minimum in areas where you know or think you might have asbestos. Um, take all the precautions to avoid damaging them and make sure that you get professionals to come in and remove it if you're going to do a removal project. Don't use dry methods. If you know it's up in an attic somewhere in an insulation, you don't want to sweep with a broom and a dustpan or a normal vacuum because that'll release the fibers. You want to use wet, meth wet methods if possible, which is a rag to wipe areas down. Uh, and if you know you have asbestos paneling, you want to do your best to avoid sawing or sanding or drilling any holes in that material. Here's some old ads. You can't, they didn't really turn up that great, but some old ads I found on the internet, which are interesting. I like this one here. Uh, the little, the bottom part, it's for a curtain theater in the old theaters. It says, when you think of asbestos, you think of John's Manville. I think there's a marketing exec somewhere who probably regretted that one. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, asbestos roofing, old asbestos mitts, and here's a few pictures. Here's some damaged pipe insulation. If you guys have seen anything like this in your home, it's got that cardboard wrap on the inside, and then they sprayed asbestos down into that material. It's called air cell. Uh, troweled on the elbows and fittings of pipes. Boilers, there's an old boiler in the area. I like this one too. There's an Easter basket and a bike right around there. <laughs> Don't disturb it if it's around. Don't put your Easter basket by it. And here's some asbestos insulation. Um, a lot of insulation can look like this. So don't just think if you have some old gray insulation up there, you've got asbestos in your attic. The only way you can positively identify it, take a little bit of it, put it in a bag, and you send it to a lab down in Denver. And they, it has to be identified under a microscope. It's the only way to tell. And there's no easy transition here, but we'll just move quickly into mold. And that's a great picture under a sink. Um, there are no regulations at this point associated with mold. It's simply, um, you know, health standards. The key to this with mold is that if you have a mold problem, you've got a moisture problem and you need to control that moisture problem. You need to control the mold and you need to fix the problem. If you've got a leak in the roof and you just take care of the mold, the leak's going to come back, the mold's going to come back. If you know of a leak that's happening in your house and you can get to it and dry it within 24 to 48 hours, you can avoid a lot of problems with mold. So that's really the take home message. Moisture control is the key to mold control. Um, they're decomposers, they're in the natural environment, they break down leaves out there in the forest and they're all around us. They, um, they act through spores that are in the air and so you can't get rid of spores. Uh, they're coming into your home, but if you eliminate their source of moisture and their ability to grow, grow on wet surfaces, you can limit that. Um, there you go, mold will not grow without moisture. So molds produce allergens and irritants and potentially toxic substances. And uh, Lucinda touched on this earlier, you get similar symptoms to hay fever with mold. If you have a lot of mold in your house, that's a just unbelievable 
mold problem in that picture, but um, I don't know that our dry climate would allow for something like that to happen. But anyways, it's, it's always an interesting photo to look at. If you want to buy a little moisture meter as shown in this picture, you can touch it up against uh, like drywall or concrete or things in your house where you've got problems and it'll give you a reading. A lot of agricultural extension services provide information, guidelines for moisture in your house. A common one I've seen is 15% on one of these handheld things. If it's 15% or more, you've got a moisture problem, you need to try and dry it out or perhaps replace that building material. Again, fix the problem. Don't just clean the mold. You've got to fix the leak. And if you do consult a professional, take the time to get references from these folks and make sure they're using some of the guidance that's out there, such as the EPA, some of the state guidance as to how you handle the mold, how they do the remediation in your house. And additionally, oftentimes what happens is that we get a mold problem generated from a sewer backup. So you have a couple issues there. If your mold problem, if your moisture problem was called, but caused by a sewer backup, you've got pathogens and things like that, so you want to get a professional that can deal with those other issues associated with contaminated water. And then a quick review of lead-based paints. Um, as you probably have heard, lead is highly toxic in the body. The Center for Disease Controls states that the number one environmental health issue for young children is lead-based paint. Some pretty serious things. The common misperception is that you have to eat lead-based paint chips to get that, when some of the studies are starting to show that it's actually the deterioration of the lead-based paint and the accumulated uh, contaminated dust. And ingestion of that, yes, but it's not a direct eating of paint, is not, eating the paint chips is not shown to be the highest uh, cause of this. There we go, lead contaminated dust. It deteriorates over time. There's a lot of information at CDPHE, the Colorado Department of Health. They do have standards through HUD for pre-renovation um, requirements for areas, that, uh, for homes and uh, facilities that are gonna have either children or elderly living in them. There are some things out there, but just in your home, if you think you have lead-based pain, again, it's similar to asbestos, check the condition. If you think the stuff's deteriorating, you, you, there are some things, there are professionals that you can call to take care of that lead-based paint and that dust. There's my contact information, and that wraps it up for me. Are there any questions? The, the question is, is there any, is there ever any reason to reseal asbestos in your house if you have it? There are a couple options, all referred to as abatement when dealing with asbestos, from fully removing it from the facility to building a containment around it to repairing it. They're all forms of abatement. If it's a certain type of material that you feel like you can seal with some kind of tape, and, and it can be done in a way that's safe, you can, you can make that safe. You can make those repairs. However, it's obvious that getting it completely out of your house is the safest method. Uh, you, if you can try and enclose it so that you don't touch it at all, but you somehow enclose it and build maybe something around it so you can't get at it, that would be um, ideal. It would depend on the kind of material that you have. Sometimes old asbestos adhesive under a floor um, instead of trying to scrape it up and, and disturbing that up into the air, they will put an encapsulant on it at the end. So that, that can be an option. Well, thank you. I'm Erin Hangler. I'm also with the City of Fort Collins. I work in the same department as Matt. A little bit different focus on the environment. Um, in regulation piece, my job with the city is I manage um, hazardous waste, special waste, and waste, regulated waste within the City of Fort Collins operations. Um, but certainly have a lot of experience with um, community waste and how to handle households. They are de de regulated differently than businesses are. So I'm here to talk to you about household hazardous waste information, kind of what it is, what you do, how you manage it, how you get rid of it, and then go into some green cleaning options to see if we can't get some of this household hazardous waste um, out of our homes. So household hazardous waste, commonly referred to as HHW. Um, kind of two objectives I'd like to have by the end of this presentation is I want everyone here to be a little smarter when you use, store, 
and dispose of your household products. And then also I want everyone to be aware that the products you use often in your home for cleaning, carpentry, auto repair, gardening, um, can be toxic, can harm you, your family, and the environment if not handled properly. So HHW, what is it exactly? Well, go home, get out your bottle of bleach or under your sink, your Drano, and look for labeling on it that reads danger, warning, caution, toxic, corrosive, flammable, or poison. In the business world, these are all words that re um, sound regulated waste stream, have to dispose of properly. Well, our homes aren't wasted, but they're certainly just as dangerous in your home as they can be in the business environment and should be taken seriously and really managed properly. These warnings do tell you if this product is harmful. So um, again, what is it? Play close attention to labels if you have these products on your house. Drain openers, oven cleaners, all automotive fluids, paint thinners, strippers, removers, grease and rust removers, glues, bug and wood killers, and then the mold and mildew re um, removers. Some of their property is what makes them good at killing mold, also makes them a hazardous waste. Um, your household bleach. I think you might be surprised, some of you, if you start to read the warning labels on that, exactly what it does. There's a reason it makes our clothes so white and clean so well. Um, per the EPA, just some basic HHW effects. Americans generate on average 1.6 million pounds or tons of HHW per year, and the average household can accumulate as much as 100 pounds of these products in their home, garages, under your sinks, um, in your storage closets. Um, oftentimes outside in a shed. A lot of common products can be HHW, CFLs, paints, cleaners, oils, batteries. Um, the more and more we get electronic, all our rechargeable batteries contain heavy metals and really should be managed in place. If those heavy, heavy metals get into our environment, they do cause a lot of problems, um, especially with um, people that are exposed to them. Matt touched on that a little bit with the lead-based paint. Um, a lot of our rechargeable batteries have lead in them as well. Improper disposal of these wastes really include anything from pouring them down the, your um, sink drain if it's something you don't want to pouring them outside on the ground in storm sewer and in all honesty actually putting them in the trash. When we do that improperly we pose a risk to our trash haulers, our landfill workers and anyone who has the potential to be exposed at that point. So a couple do's for managing HHW. Carefully read and follow the warning handles and instructions on the container and package label. And I've heard a couple people talk about MSDSs, material safety data sheets. You go to Walmart and you buy Drain Cleaner X, it's not gonna come with a material safety data sheet. You really gotta rely on that label and read it carefully and what the warnings are. Um, pesticides especially, I don't know if anyone, you pull out the label and it just grows and grows and grows and gets longer and longer. So it is diligent, but look for the different headings and the warning properties. And by law, if these products are toxic, flammable, corrosive, they do have to put them on the labels um, for even the uh, commercial uh, section, you know, Walmart's common goods. And then always use up your products. Um, Old products before purchasing new ones, try to get, you know, use it up completely and rinse. And then also try to purchase the small amount you can. If you have a special job and you need a little bit of paint remover, let's not buy the gallon jug. Let's maybe buy the quart size one and see if, if that's enough to get it done. Um, it can be deceiving on how much of these products actually can be used and how far they will go. And a lot of that's also product information on the label, how many square feet it will remove, how much it will treat, et cetera. Um, do safely store these projects in the original containers and labels at all time, and try to look for less toxic alternatives. Sometimes the new and improved formula of your Windex, they've added something or changed it. It could be for the better or it could be for the worse as far as, as waste goes. So be sure and read and don't always assume the same product you've bought for years has the same chemicals in it for years. Um, and most of all, plan ahead. Don't wait until the day before you move to try to dispose of several years' worth of accumulated waste. Moving companies will not take your HHW. I'll tell you that now. They'll leave it. And don't get yourself caught in, you know, in a bind. A couple big don'ts. Um, again, never pour waste down, down your interior drain or a storm drain or even on the ground. Never mix any products together. The best example um, is ammonia and bleach.
They just cause a toxic gas and can be very dangerous, but there's several other products that will react, so please never mix anything together. That includes the Windex from old bottle to new unless you've confirmed it is the same formula that's in the one. Um, and then st never store leftover products in food and beverage containers. This is problematic um, for several reasons. Younger kids don't always also know, and then a lot of times we find elderly people who've mixed something and not labeled it, or it's in a wrong container will mistake it as well. So really two sensitive populations there that often are affected by this. So what can you do to safeguard your family and your home and your community from HHW? First of all, always, always read the labels before you buy it, and always check the product labels again before you use it. If you're cleaning your bathroom and it tells you to wear gloves to protect your skin, take those precautions, because those acute exposures over time can lead to more serious health, can lead to increased risks of dermatitis and sensitivity on your hands, and just a lot of health problems. So just please read the labels and use the products widely. And then always, always, always keep products in their um, original containers and store them safely from children and pets. I can't stress that enough. That's, um, we have so many accidental poisons in this um, country alone just from household products that it's very important to keep things stored properly and safely. Now we've all known, we've all had that container at home that's perhaps leaked in you don't wanna get rid of it, you still do it. Well, what do you do? Well, get another container that's like, for example, if you have a bleach jug that's starting to leak, get another plastic container to put that bleach in and then clearly label it. Even if possible, take the label off the original container and tape it to the new one so you are familiar what's in that product. And you know, even if guests come over and are going to clean, they're familiar what's also in that product. And then when leftovers remain, never mix anything together. Again, big message. In cattle, products can react, they can ignite, they can explode. And contaminated HHW sometimes becomes extremely hard to dispose of and hard to recycle. Many of these materials in their raw form, there's recyclable waste streams for them. Old gasoline um, can be sent to a fuel reblending program, but if it's oil gasoline with a paint remover in it, all of a sudden it's truly a toxic waste and has to go to straight to an incinerator. So green cleaning options, what can we do? Really, let's try to get the HHW out and look at some more of these green cleaning options for everyday tasks. Always remember to follow the same rules about these products and always read the label. Don't mix products together unless you know they're not gonna react. And I have some examples. There's also um, a green cleaning cookbook back on the table that has some examples. So a lot of stuff you can make at home with really stuff from the grocery store. So I just, I Googled online myself just to look for some green cleaning options and I found a common thing. I found baking soda, vinegar, and lemon juice <laughs> over and over and over. It seems like these three products can do amazing things. I found one for glass cleaner, even a toilet bowl cleaner, and then furniture polish. A few more, rug deodorizer, plant spray, and then mothballs. And I don't know, I started thinking about it. Do people buy mothballs anymore? <laughs> and so I went in actually, and they still sell them at Walmart. I didn't realize. But there's options. We got, you know, there's so many options we can do for fragrances. And out of these options, you know, lavender, rosemary, mint, a lot of these we can grow right here in Colorado in the summertime, dehydrate them, and use them the next year for our fresheners in our closets. Um, this is City of Boulder has a really good website with a lot of green cleaning options as well. If you want to go to that link, um, they had every, for every application under the sun. So what do you do if you have this HHW? How do you get rid of it? Well, the good news is um, in our community we have several options. Um, a lot of our really common goods, used oil, CFLs, rechargeable batteries are some of the easiest things to get rid of. Almost any auto parts store will take used oil from do it yourselfers They actually um, are able to sell that oil, make a little bit of a profit, it goes through a recycling facility. So it's a win-win situation. People can get rid of it properly. The um, stores are you know, kind of getting a benefit by offering this service as well. Um, locally, we have several hardware stores that will take CFLs for recycling from residents. Um, I know many of us are starting to use CFLs in our home and so when they do burn out, those have mercury in them. It is important to dispose of those properly, but we have several options locally. And then rechargeable batteries. Um, 
All your electronics stores, Best Buy, Circuit City, they have boxes when you walk in where you can dump rechargeable batteries and they recycle them as well. And then Larimer County offers a permanent household hazardous waste collection facility. It's located at the Larimer County landfill. They're in the same parking lot as the recycle bins. They're open Tuesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday from nine to four. They take almost all HHW. They do have a few um, restricted items. They do not take asbestos from homeowners. There's a special process due to state regulations for them to dispose of that. They do not take explosives or old ammunition, but there's many items they do take. And then they also have a drop and swap store. So any items they get in from the community, from residents, paint, et cetera, that's reusable, they actually give back away to the community for people to use. Um, a lot of schools, uh, drama clubs will come in and get paints to paint scenery. Fort Collins has used it to do the trash can painting program. So they really offer this service for people to come in. Um, really good for a lot of hobbyists who have small projects and want just a little thing for here and there. We're fortunate in this community to have an, a facility that's so open and available to our residents because that's not true in all communities. And then um, City of Fort Collins, we're hosting a household hazardous one day collection event, um, Saturday, June 5th at 2010. Um, we're still working out the final details, but you'll be getting um, information in your city bill and it'll also be posted at fcgov slash haswaste.com. So think about that, maybe put a little sticker on your calendar, save the date, start thinking about looking through your garages and closets and seeing what's out there. And I encourage the, those of you who have maybe um, parents or an elderly person that you're friends with, really encourage them to help get out. Um, sometimes the older the products are, the more toxic and hazardous they are. Um, they've learned a lot of things over the years on you know, um, household stuff. So, Encourage them or assist them, if possible, to gather this, this products and bring it to our one day collection event. It is for city residents only and we will ask for a utility bill for proof of residency. EPA has some wonderful links on household hazardous waste, some facts, some graphics, a lot of information. Our um, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment also has a lot of information on all communities in Colorado. If um, you move out of the Larimer County area or do live in another area or maybe have a friend in another other area, their resource is wonderful on what's available in our state. Um, Larimer County has the permanent facility and they have a page also talking about their services, what they provide, hours, what they accept. And then SCGov recycling includes CFLs, batteries, and a lot of hard to recycle items you can also get on there and see you know, maybe where you are, the closest store that would take used oil or would take your batteries so you can limit your drive miles if that's something you're interested in, in disposing of. Again, that's me. Um, if you have any questions, I can certainly always field questions during the day and I'll field questions now. Yes. Um, the question was how to dispose of burnout incandescents and burnout fluorescent bulbs. Incandescents do not have any heavy metals in them, so yes, those can go in with the rest of your household um, solid waste. Fluorescent light bulbs, like compact fluorescent light bulbs, also contain mercury. So they are important to dispose of. Um, the hardware stores will not take the two bulbs. Those, the only resource I know of locally is Larimer County. There are some mail-in resources that you can collect and do that, but um, the local resource we have for recycling fluorescent tubes is the Larimer County Household Hazardous Waste Facility. Compact fluorescents, yeah, break. EPA, they have a set of guidelines, which is also um, on FCGov's website through our utilities page. Um, there are some recommendations. They do ask that you open windows. Like asbestos, you wanna use wet cleaning methods to not disperse so you wanna get a rag, a paper towel, something you can dispose of, collect the material, the broken bulb, go ahead and seal it in a plastic bag, and then at that point, it is considered a solid waste. Um, they won't be able to get mercury out of it in a recycling facility, so that you should throw away in the trash. But for better details, um, the exact details, go to fcgov.com um, through our electrical services page. There's links on how to properly handle a broken CFL. The big message, don't vacuum. Again, try not to uh, disturb a lot of the air around the area. Yes? 
The question was, how did get bleach and drain cleaners recommend disposal for them? Those, unless they're intended to go down the drain, and only in the intended recommended amounts. If you have, you know, a whole bottle um, of a Drano, usually it'll, on the label it'd say, do not use more than X, Y, and Z at once. So yeah, certain products are acceptable. It's the large quantities when they get to the wastewater plant. It's hard for the wastewater plant to treat them out, and sometimes can upset the plant, you know, to the extent where it does make treatment harder. Questions, uh, how to dispose of medications. Um, medications is coming up a lot and a lot more in the news. And there's, we do have a few local, local options. Good Day Pharmacy will take expired medications as long as they're not on the regulated narcotic list. <laughs> um, so over-the-counter medications and personal care products, Larimer County um, program also takes the same type of medications. And they will take um, Sharps as well in a biohazard container for disposal. Unfortunately, the best recommendation now, if you have medications that are on that regulated list, which a lot of your pain management, end of life medications um, can be, the current recommendation there is to render them um, recognizable, so crushing them, mix them with kitty litter or coffee grounds, and then dispose of them in, the, um, in your trash. We don't want you to flush them down the drains. What do you do with VCR tapes <laughs> is the question. Now, that's a, a, a hard to recycle item. Um, not a lot of hazardous components to it. Those can go in the solid waste stream. There are some mail back programs that are volunteer, that are a small fee-based, um, that offer services, techno trash and stuff. You can buy a, like a kind of a prepaid box for them and fill it all with all your electronic media, VCR tapes, DVDs, all kinds of stuff, and send it back to them for a fee. Um, but we don't have any local resource for recycling VCR tapes. The question is, what do you do with alkaline batteries or batteries that aren't rechargeable? Um, alkaline batteries went through a mercury phase out in the uh, Mid-90s, I think it was. So alkaline batteries, depending on their age, some of them do have small amounts of mercury in them. They do have alkaline. Um, they're still heavy metals that can be exposed. They're not as hazardous and concentrated as our rechargeable batteries. And Larimer County um, does recycle those. They go through a facility that does recycle the alkaline batteries. I don't know all the details. I know there's three or four substances they do get out of them that they're able to reclaim. A whole bag of them? <laughs> Larimer County will take them. Um, the kicker is DOT's thrown a little bit of the wrench on how you can transport batteries. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard on the news some of the problems airlines had with the exploding lithium laptop batteries and stuff. Well, DOT did step in is really restricted on how anyone can ship batteries. So Larimer County will require ends to be taped because unfortunately in a shipping mode, they can generate heat and they, cause, they can cause explosion and fires and be quite dangerous. Um, on the road during transport. Uh, that's a personal call. I personally, no, I don't think it's better to throw them in class. I think it's better to recycle them because they do use a facility that reclaims, um, you know, some materials out of the alkaline batteries. They're certainly not as harmful as the rechargeables. Absolutely do. We never want you to throw the rechargeables in the trash because of the heavy metal content. Thank you guys very much. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Brian Woodruff. I'm in the Natural Resources Department at City of Fort Collins, and I work primarily on air quality issues. And I'm here tonight to speak with you about radon in homes. On the screen, you see the three messages that I really want to leave you with tonight. Uh, radon is a significant hazard, uh, but you can easily reduce it. Radon is easy to test for, and if you find radon in your home, it's easy to fix. What is radon? Radon is a gas, uh, a radioactive gas that occurs naturally. Uh, it, you can't see it or smell it, uh, and it enters the buildings from uh, the soil. Um, we have a lot of uh, uranium in the soils around, around here. The uranium decays into radium uh, through a radioactive process, and that uh, decays further into radon. Once it, once it decays into radon, it becomes a gas, and so it, begins, it can move through the soil and enter your home. The rest of the radioactive materials are, are fixed in solid, uh, so uh, 
we, we're not concerned about them migrating into our homes. It's only the radon that does this. Why is radon a concern? Radon decays into radioactive particles called radon decay products, uh, which are present in the air inside your home. These particles can, get uh, can be easily breathed in into your lungs, and they can be deposited there at, until they shoot off an alpha particle in a, in a um, decay process. Because um, these decays are occurring in this uh, very soft, uh, sensitive lung tissue, uh, the alpha particles can cause damage. And over time, the accumulated uh, damage can lead to lung cancer. I'd like to uh, speak a little bit about the, uh, how much risk is involved there. Um, I have a quote here from the U.S. Surgeon General, who is the top public health officer for the nation. Uh, he says this, Indoor radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States. Breathing radon over prolonged periods can present a significant health hazard uh, to families all over the country. It's important to know that this threat is completely preventable. Radon can be detected with a simple test and fixed through well-established venting techniques. <clears throat> it turns out that radon is responsible for roughly 21,000 deaths each year in the United States. It's the second leading cause of cancer after smoking. But for people who don't smoke, it's the top, it's the leading cause of cancer. How is radon drawn into a building? The reason it, it moves into the building is because there's typically a negative pressure inside the building. Uh, it's caused by uh, a thermal stack effect uh, which is the same, uh, the same physical principle that happens in a chimney. When the, the hot air is rising, it creates a, uh, a suction at the base of the, of the chimney. So warm air inside the building is, is uh, pulling upwards and is pulling uh, gases in from, uh, through cracks and gaps in the foundation and around uh, utility penetrations, sump pumps, and so forth. <clears throat> so that's how it gets in. And the amount of... Uh, radon that gets in, it depends on a number of factors. Uh, the, the particular uh, negative pressure in the, in the house, it's also dependent on the amount of uranium that's in the soil around the house, and also the porosity. So if you have a really tight soil, the radon can't migrate very well, but a, a looser soil will, will allow it. And the only way you can find out uh, what you have in the house is to test it. Many people want to know, is there, are there safe places in Fort Collins, you know, places that are really hot or places that are really safe? And the answer is no, you can't tell. You have to test every house. Even houses that are side by side can have quite different uh, radon levels in them. So um, we encourage every family to test their home for radon. Testing is easy. These uh, do-it-yourself radon test kits are, they're for sale here tonight and uh, people can purchase them uh, year-round at two locations in Fort Collins. Uh, one is at the Senior Center on Raintree Drive. The second one is at the Development Review Center at 281 North College Avenue. The kit that is most often used is on the left in the screen. This is a short-term test kit. You open it up and expose it for three to seven days in the house, um, and then seal it and mail it to the laboratory. The laboratory then mails the, um, uh, mails the result back to you. This is what the test kit looks like when it's open. It's just an envelope. It's, it contains activated carbon, which uh, draws the radon uh, into it. And then when, the, when it gets to the lab, they're, they're able to determine the amount of radon that was present when, uh, during the test. Um, the $3.50 that we charge for this covers the kit the prepaid envelope to mail it back to the lab and the letter that comes back to you. So that's all covered in $3.50. The long-term kit um, is, is for determining the average exposure that you have over a long period of time. And we recommend that uh, people do that test as well um, so that they can determine the average year in, year out level. That's really what you wanna know to determine the amount of risk that you have from radon exposure. What happens if you find elevated radon levels? Uh, it's easy to, uh, to fix the house. The, the process is called mitigation. 
and Fort Collins has several certified radon mitigators who are able to do this kind of work. Some of them have been doing it for over 10 years and have, have become highly skilled. And they're all, um, well, the, the ones in Fort Collins currently are all certified by the National Environmental Health Association, so they, they can be uh, trusted to know what they're doing. Uh, the typical cost of a radon mitigation is in the range of 800, 800 to $1,200. Uh, it can be higher than that if you have a crawl space or if you have a, uh, some sort of complexity in the foundation of the home or, or a really wide footprint home. It can be higher than this. But this, the, the typical uh, fix is between $800 and $1,200. What you see on the screen there is, a, is the, uh, the typical radon uh, reduction system is called sub-slab suction. The mitigator will drill a hole in the slab at the lowest level of your home and glue in a pipe there that acts as a pathway for the radon to come to the outside air. That pipe is uh, typically run up the side of the building. Uh, there's an inline fan that creates a, a little bit of suction in the pipe at all times so that the radon is drawn uh, toward the pipe and out into the outside air. Called sub-slab depressurization. Briefly, the uh, the Fort Collins radon program consists of these uh, four elements currently. We have low-cost low test kits available at two locations. Again, that's the Senior Center on Rain Tree Drive or the Development Review Center at 281 North College. We also have zero interest loans available uh, to, uh, to cover the cost of mitigation. We have an application process uh, for that and the eligibility uh, for the loan basically is that you're a, c a customer of Fort Collins Utilities because the, uh, the payback is on your utility bill. Um, we have two regulations in Fort Collins relative to radon. Home buyers must be provided with a brochure, a general uh, information brochure about radon. I have a copy of it here. <clears throat> this is general information about radon such as I've uh, spoken to you about tonight. Um, so each buyer of a home in Fort Collins is made aware that radon is an issue uh, and they can take action on that if they wish. Finally, new homes must include a basic radon system during new construction. This has been uh, true since uh, 2005, January, and it's the same system that you saw in the previous slide, except it doesn't have a fan. So it has the pipe creating a, a pathway for radon to escape to the outside air but it doesn't have the, the fan in it. It's called a passive radon reduction system. And typically that system will reduce the radon by about half. And uh, many houses uh, don't have to do anything further to, to get down to, um, to lower levels. Finally, we'll go back to the, um, the summary message. Radon is a significant health hazard and you can easily reduce it. It's easy to test your home and it's easy to fix. We encourage every family to test for radon and if, if you find elevated levels to, to mitigate it. And I think I have time for uh, some questions. The, the question is, is there a, a variation in the amount of radon that comes out of the ground in summer versus winter? Uh, and there may very well be. Uh, I know that, um, uh, that radon varies uh, from day to day according to the, um, the atmospheric pressure. So for, when we have a low pressure system over Fort Collins, it's drawing radon out of the soil more than, uh, than with a high pressure system. Uh, in the winter time, you have more of a stack effect because the, the contrast between the, the, air, the warm air inside the buildings versus outside the buildings creates more suction than it occurs during the summer. So those are the factors to consider. Well, there's, there's radon in the outside air all the time. The, the typical background is uh, uh, 0.4 picocuries per liter, and that compares uh, with, uh, with four picocuries, which is the, the level that we try to uh, avoid. Uh, I should explain that uh, picocuries per liter is, a, is just the way uh, uh, that the intensity of the radon um, uh, radiation is measured. It's a measure of the number of disintegrations over a period of time in a given volume of air. And it's named after Marie Curie, who is uh, the, uh, the person, the scientist, Polish scientist who discovered uh, radiation. 
So picocuries per liter of air is the way it's measured. Um, the level that the Surgeon General recommends that you take action to mitigate your home is, is four picocuries. Um, about 70% of Fort Collins homes have levels above four. So this, this is an area where you're quite likely to find uh, greater than four picocuries. <clears throat> Excellent question. Yes, we've done some research on that in Fort Collins uh, uh, through the Radiological Health Department at CSU. And we were able to determine that uh, uh, in basements tend to be about twice as um, concentrated as the first floor. So that's, and it stands to reason because the, uh, the source of the radon is from the base um, of the house. Uh, so as you go up in the house, you, you're exposed to less and less uh, radiation. Um, one of the, uh, that results in a recommendation for testing. You're supposed to test on the lowest lived in level of the home in order to determine the exposure. Yes, the tests are, are fairly accurate and um, uh, there are uh, alternatives. These, these, uh, these radon test kits that we sell uh, are top quality, but there are other uh, test kits available in hardware stores and, and online. Uh, or you can get a professional tester to come and test your home as well. Um, but uh, the, the do-it-yourself kits are just fine for the purposes that we're doing here. Okay. <clears throat> They used to call me the grass guy, but with the medical marijuana now, I don't want, I don't want to be called that, so. so I'm the turf guy, okay? All right. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, maybe ha how you can have a pesticide-free lawn, and, uh, and you really can. Uh, we're lucky in Colorado because we've got a climate that really doesn't um, uh, encourage disease development. We have relatively few insect problems. You know, we do get weeds, uh, but it's, it's a much better place to grow grass than in places like Illinois or North Carolina or places like that. By the way, how many native Coloradans in here? Yeah, there never are many. <laughs> so we've all moved here from somewhere else, and usually it's from a place where it rains more. Yeah, so you've got to water your lawn and all that kind of stuff. This is just shock to people from Pennsylvania or something like that, that you ever have to water a lawn. Um, so there are some things that are a little bit different about taking care of turf here in uh, Colorado versus uh, many parts of the country. So we'll just kind of talk about that uh, and, uh, and how you can have a, a pesticide-free lawn. And, and in some people's minds, they, they, they equate that with organic lawn production. There's no uh, official uh, description or uh, definition of organic lawn care, unlike uh, for organic food production. Uh, there's national standards for organic food and they're very strict uh, for lawn care. Really, any kind of lawn, any lawn care company can call themselves organic and get away with it because there's no regulation and nobody policing uh, lawn care to see if you're really doing things organically. Uh, I would imagine someday, somewhere, some state is probably going to be in the Northeast, probably something like Massachusetts or Vermont or someplace like that's going to have an official definition for what is meant by organic lawn care. But uh, for now, especially out here in the West, it's like the wild, wild West. You can call yourself whatever you want and say you're doing organic lawn care. Um, so from that perspective, if you really want to do organic or sustainable lawn care, maybe you're better off doing it yourself. And there, so that's what I'm going to talk about is how you can do things yourself and really minimize or maybe even totally eliminate the use of pesticides in a, in a lawn. Instead of talking about organic lawn care, sometimes I talk about sustainable lawn care and you know, there's all these definitions of sustainability and uh, you go to Wikipedia and there's, there's all kinds of big lengthy definitions of what we might be sustainable. But from a uh, kind of a lawn or landscape perspective, I like this one. Uh, it's uh, from University of Minnesota and they talk about how to have a sustainable uh, lawn or landscape. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I talk about lawn care, but, you know, that kind of extends to trees and all the other things that you grow in your landscape. But I am a turf specialist, so I kind of stick to that. Um, but in a lot of ways, what we're trying to get with a lawn is something that looks nice, you know, it keeps the dust down, keeps the mud down. It's a nice place for the kids and the dog to play. Uh, you know, makes the, the, our, our property look nice, gives you curb appeal. If you're trying to sell your house, it sells a lot better if you get a nice lawn than if you got a lousy looking lawn, okay? 
Uh, so there's some curb appeal there, and it does, you know, a nice landscape does enhance the value of a, of a house. And uh, so especially if you are trying to sell your house, people realize that. And so I get calls from people, how do I make my lawn look really good in like two days? Well, maybe resodding is, is there, but you know, so it's like you got to think a little bit ahead, you know, kind of like disposing of all the household waste. Don't wait until the day before the movers are here to try to fix your lawn. It can't happen that quickly. So it is a living organism, and, and uh, so it does take time to make it look nice. So this is kind of a good definition, but uh, uh, if you really want to know about sustainable and organic um, uh, lawn management, there's, there's a really a, a good website, uh, and you can go to there, and they've got all kinds of tips about uh, organic lawn care products, organic fertilizers, uh, just a lot of stuff that you can do on your lawn. And it's, this is geared towards um, uh, the homeowner and doing it yourself uh, and not so much against uh, or towards uh, the uh, uh, commercial people, but a lot of good information. It's, it's pretty unbiased. Some, some uh, websites you go to, um, they're almost anti-turf, okay? Uh, and it's like, you don't even want a lawn much less learn how to manage it. So uh, this one is very balanced in its approach to a lawn care. And, it, and it's, it's pretty honest saying, you know, if you want a totally pest-free, weed-free lawn and you're a lawn, um, you know, a maniac and, and you want, you know, perfection, um, you're probably not going to be able to do it using totally organic products. Uh, but again, luckily here in Colorado, you can have a really nice looking lawn with very, very minimal or even sometimes almost no pesticide use. So. Go to that website, lots of stuff. I mean, lots and lots and lots of stuff on there. And, it's, and they keep it pretty up to date, so that, that's a good one. Too often when people have problems in their lawns, the first thought is, what do I spray? What do I, they see a bug in the lawn and, and it's like, I, I should kill that thing. That, well, I don't even know what it is. It could, there's, most of the insects you find in lawn in Colorado are friendly insects. They're not causing problems. They're not eating the grass. Uh, a lot of times they're predatory insects that are eating each other, you know, so it's uh, it, 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 quite often the insects you see in a lawn here in Colorado are perfectly fine to leave alone, uh, you know, show them to your kids and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, Disease problems, we get very few disease problems. Uh, in weeds, we do get weeds, uh, but I, I, I give a whole talk on, on, I call them indicator weeds. Certain weeds can be indicators of things you're doing wrong in your lawn, overwatering, underwatering, not fertilizing enough, mowing it too short, those type of things, uh, where it's too shady or it's too compacted or it's too salty. So I can walk into a lawn and by looking at the weeds you have, I can tell you something about how you're managing your lawn. Um, so your first instinct shouldn't be, what do I kill these weeds with? Your first thought should be, Maybe I should find some help and, and, uh, and get a little bit of knowledge about how to care for my lawn a little bit better. And that's what we do at the Extension Office, Larimer County Extension Office. Uh, we've got master gardeners there. Um, so you can go in, into the office and talk to them. You can call, you can email, and get lots of good information on how to main, maintain your lawn a little bit, uh, little bit better so it is more pest free. Uh, we have a program called Lawn Check where for $50, they'll come out and they'll look at the lawn, they'll tell you about the weeds you have, why you've got those weeds, uh, where you might have irrigation problems, uh, those type of things. So it's, it's a really nice service uh, through our extension office. Uh, the idea with, with any kind of a pest in the lawn is to try to manage it using cultural practices. So improve your mowing, your fertilization, your irrigation. In some cases, it'll totally eliminate the pest problem. Um, or in, at least it'll minimize the, the, the severity of it. And so that's what we talk about. We call that integrated pest management. Not just spraying it, but doing everything culturally to try to minimize that problem or perhaps even eliminate it. Um, so because of that, I'm going to talk about, for example, what we can do for weeds, insects, diseases, uh, and, and from a cultural perspective to minimize those, those types of problems. When you talk about weeds, and you, you look at this as a picture, you know, how would you like to have that neighbor? Okay, well, if you like dandelions, you want to be that person. Uh, but how can those lawns be that different? Is it just because one of them uses lots of 2,4-D? Probably not. They're, they're mowing, they're fertilizing adequately, maybe they're irrigating properly. Uh, the, the, the home with the, with the dandelions, that lawn's probably being neglected. They're probably just mowing it, and it hasn't been fertilized for years. And, you know, maybe they're not controlling other uh, variables like irrigation. Maybe they're not doing aeration, whatever the case might be. 
So that's what we do in the extension office. We go to that neighbor with the dandelions and say, okay, if you do this, 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 and this, you'll minimize the dandelions. Now you may not be able to make them go away totally with, with cultural practices, but at least you'll minimize uh, the severity of that problem. So that's the idea with, with any kind of a pest problem in turf is try to figure out why you've got that problem, correct those cultural practices, and then maybe, if you're so inclined, then use a little bit of herbicide or maybe use a fungicide for a disease problem. But um, we want to get away from the just uh, spray it, spray it, spray it, because you could kill the dandelions, but if you don't correct the cultural problem, then you might get crabgrass replacing it. Then you got to spray something for crabgrass. You get, then you get spurge, and so you end up with a shed full of all kinds of herbicides, and you haven't corrected the real problem, which is maybe you're not fertilizing properly. So keep that in mind with any kind of a pest problem. We do things to avoid getting the weeds in the first place. If you're going to plant a lawn, you want to make sure that the seed you plant has no weed seed in it. And you would be amazed. Uh, read your seed label when you go to, and I'm not going to pick on names of big box stores, but we know what a big box store is. Um, try to find seed on a shelf in any big box store that says 0.00% weed seed. You won't find it. So anytime you buy seed, you're planting weeds with that grass seed. But if you go to our, our uh, grass seed companies in the state, there are a couple of them in Greeley, Pawnee Buttes, uh, Sharp Brothers Seed, Arkansas Valley Seed. Arkansas Valley Seed works with Bath Nursery, Fort Collins Nursery. You can go in there and say, I want five pounds of some kind of bluegrass. They'll deliver it, and that bluegrass will be 100% weed free because that's what the professionals who buy grass seed want. And you can get the very same grass that they put in Coors Field or what they put in Invesco uh, Stadium. The very, very same uh, uh, grasses. And you pay about the same amount of money, too. Okay? So use weed free seed. If you buy sod from a sod grower, and we're lucky our sod growers in this state are very good, uh, make sure when they're putting that sod out, if you start seeing weeds in that sod, you don't want to be buying weeds. Okay? So prevent weeds in the first place. Then, if you do have weeds, try to figure out why you have them in the first place. Um, you know, one thing that you want to do from a cultural perspective is mow at the proper height. And for every grass that you might grow on a lawn in, in uh, Colorado, buffalo grass, tall fescue, bluegrass, whatever it is, we want to be two and a half, three, three and a half inches. You know, how many of you are golfers? Okay. Okay. No golfers. That's good. I was going to ask if you're a good golfer. You know, and every, all, all the hands go down then. Um, but people at golf, they see these beautiful fairways, and you know, they're mowed at uh, three quarters of an inch, and they want their lawn to look like that. Well, that's not impossible, but from a homeowner perspective, you usually don't, usually don't have the tools, um, and quite frankly, you don't have the, the, the turf know-how to maintain turf at that mowing height and keep it healthy. So you're much better off with a higher mowing height. You know, so you don't want to be mowing stuff at a tenth of an inch. That's what we do with golf greens. Uh, so two and a half, three and a half inches. The reason for that is the, mo the higher you mow, the deeper the roots are. The deeper the roots are, the less often you have to water. So you're saving water that way. Uh, you use fertilizer more efficiently. So the less chance of uh, uh, fertilizer leaching through the soil and getting into water. Um, the turf is more drought resistant. Um, you can have insects in the lawn, and a lot of our turf insects eat roots. Well, if you've got lots and lots of roots, you can have lots of insects down there eating those roots and you don't even know it because the top of the turf is still looking healthy because you've got enough root system to keep that, that, that grass uh, looking healthy. You know, it's kind of what we do with, uh, I'm, I'm an organic gardener. I love organic gardening. And I live up by Grant Farms. I'm surrounded by Grant Farms where I live, about 20 miles north of here. Um, you've got to grow enough so the bugs have something to eat so that you have something to eat at the end. And that's, I mean, some years the squash bugs are so bad that we get no squash. It's just, it's a fact of life. Um, but uh, if you grow enough stuff, you know, the bugs get a little, you get a little, and everybody's happy, okay? And that's, that's kind of the principle here. You have enough roots, the insects got something to eat, and you're not seeing uh, any problems with your turf. So uh, keeping nice, healthy roots is a key to help keeping the top of the turf healthy. And the easiest way to do that, or one of the easiest ways, is to uh, grow and mow, mow high, two and a half, three, three and a half inches. Here's a picture of a research um, study I did a number of years ago. And this was with a, a grass called fine fescue, which likes to be mowed high. But if you mow it low, it thins out. And Mother Nature likes to fill holes 
with some other plant. You, you, you don't see bare soil for very long anywhere, even when it's not watered. You know, bindweed will grow there, kochia, quack grass, thistle, all kinds of things will grow. And that's what nature likes to do, is fill those areas in with some kind of a plant. Well, when the turf thins out, a lot of times it's crabgrass or dandelions or something coming in. Well, this higher cut turf, that was three and a half inches, right next to it is that same grass mowed just over an inch. All that yellowish, lightish, greenish stuff you see there, that's crabgrass. There was not a single crabgrass plant where it was mowed three and a half inches. So it's competition, it's shading, and that's one of the easiest ways to keep weeds out of a lawn is to mow your grass high, okay? The other aspect of mowing high though, and another reason to mow high is frequency. Uh, most people, when do you mow your lawn? Every Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon or something like that. Um, in the spring when the grass is growing fast, and that's when grass likes to grow. It, most of our grasses are what we call cool season grasses. They like the spring, they like the fall, the middle of July, they're not so happy. They want to go dormant, actually. They want to stop growing. Uh, but in the spring, they're growing pretty fast. You should probably be mowing your lawn twice a week. So like Wednesday afternoon and Saturday morning, or Thursday and Sunday, something like that. And the reason for that is, think about this, how many plants in your landscape could you cut half the plant off once or twice a week and expect it to live? Can you do that with your tomatoes? No. Can you do it with a maple tree in your front yard? Nope. Cut that in, in half once, that, that tree's a goner. So it's pretty remarkable when you think about it that you can take half of a plant off and it grows happily back the next week, okay? Now some people don't like that, you know, if you don't like mowing, it's kind of a chore, but uh, it is pretty remarkable that, plant, that grass plants can respond that way. Well, what we found through research is if you remove no more than a third of the height at a single mowing, that plant's root system is sustained and the top of the plant looks pretty, pretty nice as well. But when you start taking half of it off, that's when you start to see problems with the roots. It actually kills roots. So we have this one third rule, you know, and that sounds like some kind of a government rule or something like, you know, who made this up? But this is research based. It's, it's, uh, so if you want your, your mowing height to be two inches, you let it to be three down to two, three down to two, three down to two. That's the one third rule, okay? If you go four down to two, you're taking half the plant off at a single mowing. And that's, that's hard on that plant. It'll survive, it will survive, but then you have a much better chance of having weeds grow on that lawn and more insect problems and decreased drought stress, okay? So mow frequently and mow high. Um, just from a kind of a sustainability perspective, how many of you, okay, anybody here not have a lawn? So you're, okay, I'm wondering why you're staying. Oh no, just because I'm so good, right? Yeah, um, you want a lawn, that's what it is. Eventually, yeah. Um, but uh, how many of you have the old fashioned push reel mowers? You know, the old, yeah, okay. And I would figure people that are interested in this kind of topic, they tend to have those kind of mowers because they don't use gas. You know, it's good exercise and all that kind of thing. But there are some other options. These are, these are electric mowers. Anyone have a Newton mower? These are the coolest. These are elect electric mowers. They're just wonderful mowers. Um, and it's a company out of Massachusetts makes these things. Um, so they're, they're quiet, um, no gas, no oil, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, very, very, very nice mowers. Uh, but the walk behind the, uh, the, the real mowers, these kind of mowers, are also very good options. So. You know, I don't know if you can call this organic, but you can call it sustainable, okay? Um, you know, a rotary mower is gonna do just a fine job too, except you got the gas and the oil and, and the noise and all that kind of stuff. So depending on your, your, your definition of sustainability, maybe those aren't the most sustainable types of mowers to use. Uh, but the, these are great mowers. And the thing I like about real mowers is that they force you, they force you to follow the one third rule. Those of you that have the push mowers, what happens if you let your grass get out of control and it gets too tall? It's a pain, because it lays the grass over rather than cutting it. So people that use these mowers, they know, I gotta mow, I gotta mow like more often than my neighbor who lets it get to be a hay field and then chops it down with their rotary mower. So that, that's another nice thing about these real type mowers, okay? Uh, grass clippings. How many of you bag your clippings? How many of you collect them? Nobody's going to admit it, I bet. Uh, but, um, you know. 
Well, so when you have lots of weeds and they're making seeds, you bag it. You know, that that's, might not be a bad strategy, but then what do you do with it? Put it in the recycling. Put it in the recycling. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not real familiar with the recycling program here because I live 20 miles north. So, yeah. Um, but the, really, the best thing to do with grass clippings is leave them on the lawn. It's free fertilizer, it's organic fertilizer. You're recycling literally nutrients in your turf system. Uh, some other things we know about recycling grass clippings is that you actually get less disease. No one, nobody knows really why that is. I think it's just better nutrient management. Um, but it's, it is healthier for the grass to recycle those nutrients. Uh, if you do have commercial lawn care, I strongly encourage you to leave your grass clippings on there because it keeps pesticides in a system where um, they're, they're le less likely to cause any kind of a problem. Some people like to take grass clippings and make compost out of them. That's great, except if you don't truly compost, and if you know anything about composting, it gets really hot through a true composting process. If you truly compost and get through the thermophilic stages where you get up to about 150 degrees, that will degrade any pesticides in there. Unfortunately, a lot of people, what they call composting, really isn't composting. And if you've got pesticides in your grass clippings, it follows through composting. Then you put them by your tomatoes, and all of a sudden your tomatoes don't look so, so happy a few weeks later. So uh, you have to be careful with grass clippings if you do have um, commercial lawn care, or if you do put pesticides on your own lawn. Just leave those clippings on the lawn. That's the safest thing to do. Now, uh, from the perspective of fertilization, there's a whole lot you can do. Um, and something that we know in studies, uh, all kinds of companies have done studies of this, is a lot of people, they can't even remember the last time they fertilized their lawn. Okay, oh, was it last year? No, maybe it was two years ago. And, you know, an old lawn, a 30-year-old, 30, 40-year-old lawn, you can get away with that. But if you've got a brand new lawn on, you know, some new housing addition on absolutely pitiful soil, you should probably be fertilizing that lawn three to four times a year. And then once it builds up organic matter, and it gets to be four and five and 10 and 15 years old, then you can go to maybe twice a year, then maybe once a year. On campus, we fertilize campus turf one time a year. And that grass looks pretty beautiful if you've ever been on campus. Um, so you don't need a lot of fertilizer on it if it's an older, older lawn. On a newer one, you do. And uh, the most important nutrient is the nitrogen in there. We don't need to put phosphorus on our lawns. I've never seen I've been doing this 30 years. I've never seen a phosphorus deficiency on a home lawn anywhere from Ohio to Illinois to Colorado. It doesn't happen. I've never seen a potassium deficiency on a home lawn. It doesn't happen. So the important thing in the fertilizer is that first number, that first nutrient, which is nitrogen, okay? Um, it's what makes the grass green and grow, traffic tolerant, all those type of things. What are the best uh, fertilizers to use? If you wanna do organic, there are all kinds of organic fertilizers out there. My personal favorite is this one right here, Baba Doo Doo. That's the best name I've ever seen for a fertilizer. Um, but uh, there are all kinds of them out there, and most of them are manure-based. Uh, they could be come from plant material, soybeans, alfalfa. There's a, a, a company in Loveland that makes something called Alpha Lawn, alfalfa-based fertilizer, very nice stuff, okay? We have rich lawn fertilizer. You've probably all seen this outside grocery stores and in nurseries. Uh, rich lawn is made down near Longmont. And so it's a byproduct. There's a big chicken or big egg uh, production facility down there for, you know, uh, uh, egg McMuffins. But of course, chickens make something else besides eggs. And so they find some way to, to, to handle that and they make it into a, a fertilizer. And in the industry, it's called DPW, stands for dehydrated poultry waste. Okay. Great fertilizer. Uh, I like to encourage people to buy local stuff. How many locavore is in here? You know what a locavore is, buying your food locally? Okay. Um, well, not that you want to be a locavore with this stuff, but in, in, anyway, I, don't, I haven't come up with a good word here, but buy your, your natural organic fertilizers locally. There's a lot of them made in California and New York. Why ship something from New York out to Colorado? You know, people pat themselves on the back saying, I'm doing things organically, but they use fertilizer from New York. Makes no sense to me. Buy your fertilizer from Richelon or from Alphalon. Uh, get the local stuff. It doesn't have to be shipped as far. You're using less energy to get it to your lawn. Okay, that just just makes sense. Uh, so rich lawn, good fertilizers. Uh, 
Scots, who would ever think Scots would go organic? You know, so turf builder, they've been making this stuff for 40 years. They see a market niche though, they see reality. There are people that want organic lawn products. And so they, within their own company, they're competing against themselves. They've got an absolutely incredible, really nice, good organic um, fertilizer and it's called Organic Choice. It's wonderful stuff. It's really excellent, excellent, natural, organic. It's certified organic fertilizer, okay? Now, if you look at the ingredients on there, it's a uh, hydrolyzed feather meal, meat meal, bone meal, and blood meal. What's that make you think of? Maybe dinner? No. Actually, it would make, maybe make you think of dinner. Um, yeah, the, the, these are leftover chickens from like Purdue and Tyson. You know, the, after you get the nice little breasts and drumsticks and wings and all the stuff that you buy in King Super or Safeway, there's a lot of chicken left over. There you go, it's in that bag. Recycling at its finest. It's great fertilizer, okay? Also, read your pet food bag when you go home. This, this dog on the, on, they always put dogs and kids on these bags. What's the implication? It's safe for them, yeah. But they've got on the turf builder bag too. Um, and turf builder's okay as well. Uh, but dogs like this stuff, they'll eat it because it tastes like dog food. It's yummy to these guys, okay? Um, but it, it won't hurt them, okay? Juicy lawn, this is a great one. This is a liquid lawn care stuff. This is made from beets, sugar beets up in Canada. So it's a liquid lawn care product. Clover, so is this a weed or is this a wildflower? Some people like clover in their lawns. Some people don't, they're afraid of bees. Uh, I'm a beekeeper, I like clover. Uh, but there's a company out of the Netherlands, they've got something that's called micro clover. It grows under your grass so you never see the, the weed, if you want to call it a weed. But clovers take nitrogen out of the air and it fertilizes the soil. So their idea is you never have to fertilize your lawn again if you get this micro clover growing under the turf. Other things to do in your lawn. Aerate your lawn once a year. It relieves compaction, helps root growth. It's a very simple thing to do. Once a year is a good thing. This is what you get. Nice roots growing down those holes. Water infiltrates better. Instead of running off into the street, it runs into the soil. Um, don't fall for these. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Okay, so don't go for that. Water your lawn reasonably. Here's my easy lawn watering technique. You don't need a fancy controller. You don't need to go to some website and get ET numbers. You, know, you can do that, and that's a real scientific way to do it. Put a bunch of water on, and don't water again until the turf needs it. How do you know when it needs it? I think I got a picture here. Maybe I don't. Okay. Um, you see wilt. You see footprints in your lawn, and the turf doesn't jump back again. So maybe every three days, four days, five days, six days, seven days. And then water again, put a bunch of water in. And that's how you water your lawn. I can get by on about 12 inches of water in a bluegrass lawn doing this. Whereas a lot of people with automatic irrigation systems, they're putting 20 or 24 inches a year on their lawn, okay? Water at night, between nine at night, nine in the morning, it doesn't hurt the grass. It doesn't cause more disease. You read about that in papers and stuff, they're wrong. It's, it's okay to water at night. Um, if you want to do other types of weed control, corn gluten meal. There's a guy at Iowa State University, Nick Christians, discovered corn gluten meal. He's a CSU grad, so go Rams. Uh, he discovered this idea of using corn gluten meal as a weed control product. So you can go down to Bath, you can go down to Fort Collins Nursery, you can go to Gullies and buy this corn gluten meal. It's, it's animal feed, but you can spread it on your lawn. It suppresses diseases and it fertilizes. It's expensive. It is pricey stuff, but if you want to do things organically, this is another good option. Some things that might be coming up in Canada, they have much stricter pesticide laws and they're, they're, they're kind of anti-pesticide up there, especially in Ontario. So the, they, they're trying to come up with natural organic um, weed control products. Here's something that's sold in Canada. It works. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a, it's a fungus that causes a major lettuce disease in the United States. So the US, the EPA and the USDA won't let them sell it down here. You know, they grow lettuce in Canada too, but for some reason they're not worried about it. But it, it, it controls dandelions as, as well as Weed Be Gone does. Pretty remarkable. So I'm thinking we're gonna have stuff like this eventually that is natural, it's organic, that we can do weed control with. Um, right now there's things that you can get. 
um, that have clove oil and uh, acetic acid, and they smell like you know this nice salad oil when you spray it on your lawn. But it will kill small weeds. It won't kill a dandelion. It'll burn it back. It'll disappear for a while, then it comes back. So we don't have really good natural organic lawn care products yet, but there's a bunch of them here. Um, I love the names on these. Nature's Avenger. That one sounds mean, doesn't it? Doesn't kill weeds very well, though. Sounds nice, though. Um, there are the organic soaps that kind of burn the leaves. They burn the plant, and you hope it doesn't come back. If it's bindweed, it'll come back. If it's this, it'll come back. If it's a tiny little spurge plant, it won't come back. So some weeds these kill, sometimes they don't. And then finally, not all bugs in your lawn are, are bad ones. This is something called a big-eyed bug, and it's eating a bad bug. So the big-eyed bug's a good one. That little one that's impaled on its little nose thing and it's sucking the life out of it, that's a bad bug. That's a chinch bug, and they do harm your turf. So, but they look kind of alike, and people see these big-eyed bugs and they freak out and they want to kill them. Now, before you kill a bug, you want to make sure what you're trying to control. So the idea isn't you see little bugs, you destroy them, and then it's like, boom, like this. That's not, that shouldn't be the goal. Most of the bugs in our, in our, in our lawns are good ones. For the few bad ones we do have, this is kind of cool, uh, though not real appetizing to look at, but that's a grub, and you see all those little wiggly things in there? Those are nematodes, and you can get parasitic nematodes now that you apply to your lawn. They go out searching around, and they find a grub. They crawl inside. They eat its inside out and reproduce, and then that thing busts open, and all these other nematodes go scurrying around looking for another grub to attack, so that's pretty cool. So we'll end with that, but um, I got a lot more information on my website. Um, just Google CSU turf and you'll go right to it. And I got lots and lots of stuff there about uh, conventional lawn care, organic lawn care, uh, my emails there. I even am either brave enough or stupid enough to put my cell phone number on my website. So thank you. How's this for props? <laughs> Um, it's really great to be here with you all tonight. Um, as I said, I'm the bike coordinator for the city of Fort Collins, and one of my um, duties as bike coordinator is to get more people riding bikes on a daily basis, and to do so in a safe and fun manner. And uh, what I wanted to do first was talk about the bicycle just a little bit, so you can have an idea of why and how it can be comfortable and enjoyable while riding a bicycle. Um, <clears throat> first of all, you can see that my handlebars are pretty wide here, and they really set me back a little bit, so that when I'm riding my bicycle, I'm very upright. I'm not leaned over too far, and I'm not stretched out like this. I'm actually well positioned in the middle of my bike, which allows for an equilibrium and a good center of balance between both wheels. It's very important when riding a bike. <clears throat> Another thing is the saddle. I've got a very comfortable saddle here. And as we all know, a good comfy seat can either make you or break you. And so having a good comfy seat when you're running a bike um, quite a bit is very important. Now how do we wear all these fancy clothes and still ride a bicycle? Uh, these fenders right here. This is, these wraparound fenders right here help out so much with keeping you dry. Um, like I said, I rode here tonight and you know, I didn't have any issues whatsoever with all the snow and sleet and water on the, on the roads. And, um, these things really help you stay dry at night <clears throat> or while riding um, during the wet seasons. Um, another thing is uh, the bike lights here. Uh, this is a pretty bright, bright light, as you can see. This is really good for riding the trails at night, early mornings, um, evenings when you're coming home. But then I have these little frog lights right here, which are really good for riding around the city. And, and really, they're about for, you know, to, to help you be seen. Um, when you're riding on the streets at night. There's usually enough ambient light for um, one to not have such a bright headlight. So these things work really good. You can put them on your handlebars. They're called NOG lights. And the city has a program called the Be Seen program campaign that we give these things away to people who need bike lights. So check our website for that. But they're great. They're really bright. And, uh, and they really help um, cars be are, are, cars are able to see you really well with these types of things. <clears throat> Another thing that really helps out too is while riding at night <clears throat> is I have a jacket that has very well, very good reflective material, it's very visible. 
So there are two reflective stripes coming down the back over here. So people can really see me very well. And also on the front too, and there's some things on the arm. So you really want to be seen. These aren't, this isn't the day and age where you want to ride like you're invisible. You want to ride like you're a part of traffic. You need to be very confident and uh, take your place in traffic and um, <clears throat> share the road with others. This is as they would do with you. <clears throat> so talking about riding around town and uh, keeping yourself safe while doing so, um, a couple things. Um, let's, let's say you're on the bike trail. One of the, one of the big um, pieces of good um, bike riding etiquette is to be um, communicative and with pedestrians and um, other bicyclists. And a fun way to do it is to have a, a bike bell. It's a great way to say, I'm up on your right or up on your left. You know, and typically you want to pass um, on the left-hand side. So using your bike bell to communicate with other bicyclists when coming into intersections or on the bike trails themselves with pedestrians. Because the problem is, is that typically people get frightened when you ride your, your bike past them too fast and they they get frightened and it kind of rubs off them them the wrong way upon bicyclists. So, so talk to people out there when you're, when you're riding your bike. <clears throat> a couple things too, as you know, um, when riding in bike lanes, um, we've got 280 miles of bike lanes here in Fort Collins. Uh, that really helps um, to create a conducive atmosphere for biking. When there aren't bike lanes, the bicyclist does have the right to take the road. Uh, and, and that means be able to take the lane and get into the far hand, right hand side of the lane. But if there are any type of um, obstructions, potholes, debris, you may enter into that traffic lane for a reasonable amount of time so that you yourself are safe while riding. <clears throat> you always want to use hand signals too. Um, and don't throw out hand signals that are, you know, kind of far to the low and too cool. Hey, I'm taking a ride here, you know. You want to be like this, you know. You want to, you want to be, like I said, be out there, be seen, be visible, and really make those left hand turns. And you actually can now these days use your right hand turn instead of having to do this one. Um, you know, you could do that if you really have to. You know, like talk to people. That's better than anything else. Um, and, and, and eye contact is, is really important. Um, and going with the flow of traffic you know, when you're in a bike lane and um, doing your best to not ride on the sidewalks now, biking on the sidewalks is legal in the city of Fort Collins, except for downtown. However, the trouble spot occurs when you are riding on a bicycle and you cross into an intersection. That's the number one type of accident that has been occurring um, in, in our town, anyway. <clears throat> when you come across, uh, with, when you're on the sidewalk and you come into the intersection, the motorist at the intersection is not necessarily looking to the right or to the left on the sidewalk. They're looking at the road. So if you come jarting out into the um, intersection from the sidewalk, um, you put yourself in a compromised um, situation. So again, a big part of that is ride when you can on the road and on the bike lanes and <clears throat> be predictable um, and use common sense and stop at stop signs and traffic lights. Uh, that's one of the big things that we're trying to change so we can create a mature culture, biking culture here is to, um, so that we can viably share the road with others is to um, make stops and, and respect people's turns at stop signs and, and, and such. Now I've talked a little bit about how to keep you safe and, and, and uh, invisible while riding your bike and some of those important things that you should know. Um, but I also want to talk about bikes as a utilitarian vehicle. Um, bikes, you know, for a long time had been looked at as a recreational tool. Um, actually, biking has been around longer than a car. Did most of you know that? Um, actually, bicycling is, um, the bicycle movement actually started the roads movement. So bicyclists had um, paved surfaces in which they could um, ride their bicycles in the late, um, in the early 1900s. Of course, with the expansion of vehicles and the affordability and the, um, the growing in, um, roadway infrastructure, um, car transportation, vehicle transportation took over that. But it's re-emerging. It's coming back again. We're seeing it retro. More and more people are doing this. The national trend is growing. Fort Collins trend is growing. Um, we're actually, you could consider us a, a top 10 U.S. biking city. We're a gold level, um, excuse me, a gold level bicycle friendly community. 
as designated by the League of American Bicyclists, a national advocacy organization that reviews communities around the U.S. and then designates them with a platinum, a gold, a bronze, or honorable, excuse me, silver, bronze, or honorable mention. So we're up there in the ranks of being a top 10 U.S. city. Um, and, and what's incredible and helps with that ranking too is that we have a pretty high percentage of those who commute on a daily basis by bicycle. Um, in Fort Collins, the U.S. Census um, stated in 2008 from, through the American Community Survey that 7.4 percent ride their bike to work. Now that's not counting people who ride their bike to school, to the library, to the grocery store. That's just people who bike to work. Now that's compared to 1 percent the national average. So nationally we've, we have a lot of work to do but towns, um, some towns in Colorado and California and, and in Oregon you know, have really accelerated the growth of, of biking there. But ways in which you can use your bike as a means of transportation are having these comfort items like I talked about keeping you dry um, and safe but also you can get um, bike trailers and so if you're going to the grocery store um, to invest in a, in a simple bike trailer um, hooks up to your rear um, chain stay down here um, or at your seat post for some models they work really well to, for putting up all kinds of um, um, groceries or anything that you're, you're purchasing from anywhere and so there's actually um, a, a, a local manufacturer um, here in town called Cycle Tote. Um, and so if you were looking to buy uh, a bike trailer here locally, we have a company here. And actually, Bill Jenkins and Barbara right here, uh, raise your hand. These guys are the purveyors of, of Cycle Tote, and we do a lot of things with them in the community. And um, I'm sure they could probably answer some questions after the seminar, too. So um, again, biking is a great way to get around town. It really is convenient. It's actually pretty quick. You should feel safe out there, but being safe is about being confident and being out there and, and being visible while on the road. So with that, I'd like to end this uh, discussion and actually answer a couple questions if I could. Oh yes, fcgov.com slash bicycling. And that website has all kinds of resources um, from um, local groups to rules of the road um, to all the programs that we're working on. Um, educational information, it's, it's an excellent resource for both locally, regionally, and nationally. Absolutely, and I'll speak to that briefly. Um, so right now, there are two methods of signal actuation for cyclists in Fort Collins. Uh, one is called a loop detector, which is an ele electromagnetic detector in, in, the, um, in the road that picks up the presence of metal, which um, si um, gets the light signal um, turned. And then the other one is a video camera. And, and that's the new wave. That's the new technology. And so um, a, a video camera at the top of the traffic light will see a bicyclist there and then also um, trip the sensor. Um, so where we're at right now is that we have approximately um, 25 to 30 loop detectors within the city. Where we're going is uh, with the video detector. And, and over time, streets uh, and traffic operations are work on, working on each individual signal to um, observe bicyclists while they're there. Um, so, but if there are specific routes in which there is a high level of bicycle traffic, we, need, we do need to know that. So um, you can contact me w with your concern on where you'd like to see one, and we can add it to the, to the quiver, or to the query of, uh, of, of um, needed signal changes. We've been working with traffic operations and uh, police services on this one because it happens a lot. There are, there are intersections still in Fort Collins that won't pick up a bicycle. So if you're at a light and it's gone through several cycles and it's not identifying you um, and there, are, are, there is no other traffic coming from the other direction or behind you to signal that light because that light, it might be early in the morning on your way to work. Um, <clears throat> the second thing that we suggest you do is use the crosswalk button. And then finally the third, if that's not an, op an opportunity or an option, um, then after waiting several light cycles, you can say that that light is not, um, manu that light is not manu sorry, working properly. It's malfunctioning for the bicyclists. And then you may go through that red light. But that's the third option. You should probably see people do it a lot. And that's, that's, that's part of the behavior that we're trying to change right now. 
Um, and that's part of legitimizing uh, bicycles as a form of transport, uh, you know, a normalized form of transportation. But no, um, at stop signs you should make a full stop, and at traffic lights, you know, most lights are timed, and or have an electromagnetic um, detector and or a video camera that will detect your presence. So don't run through the red light. Um, thank you very much. The last thing I wanted to say was um, notice my helmet. That's a that's a very important thing to wear also and. Having a helmet fit right is, is also very important. You don't want to have a helmet that's too far up on your forehead like this. You ever see that out there? I have a funny hairline, don't I know? Um, <clears throat> you want it so that it's snug down your forehead, protects the back of your head too, and uh, usually put about one to two inches between your, um, um, your buckle here as well, and about two inches from the top of your, your eyebrows to the top of your head. So those are the things that are going to get you safe. Try it if you haven't yet, and um, be safe out there. Thank you.